Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Instagram Ethics, a conversation on Catholic social teaching and social media activism. My name is David Goodwin, and I am the Assistant Director at the Fordham University Center on Religion and Culture. Today's event is part of the Duffy Fellows Program. This program was founded in the memory of the late James Duffy, a longtime friend of the CRC and Fordham University. The Duffy Fellows Program funds the original research and writing of Fordham students and recent graduates exploring the intersection between religion and culture. Support from people like you makes all our programs possible. If you're interested in making a gift, I'll be sharing a link in a moment. Social media helped propel recent political movements, such as Black Lives Matter and Me Too. How might Catholic social teaching play a role in such activism? What might it tell us about online engagement? In this presentation, 2021-2022, Duffy Fellow, Samantha Sclafani, will explore the position of religious ethics in the digital public square. Now, allow me to introduce Samantha. Samantha is a 2022 graduate of Fordham University with a double major in political science and theology and a 2021-2022 Duffy Fellow. She plans to attend law school in the fall of 2023. Samantha, the show is yours. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Samantha. Um, firstly, I just wanna thank you all for coming to consider some of these ethical debates um, that have been occurring with the rise of social media activism over um, roughly the past two decades. Um, I'm really hoping that this presentation will make for an interesting conversation. Uh, like David said, I recently graduated Fordham and I obtained a degree in theology and political science. Um, and to give a little background on my interest in pursuing this research, it really came from this new wave of activism that was occurring online, uh, especially given the COVID pandemic that prevented so many people from being able to physically leave their homes and protest. Uh, many social movements in the past decade have used online activism in some way, but it seemed to really elevate into a different level following the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movements, both of which had really strong internet presences and internet origins. Um, and upon further consideration of these movements, I realized there was so much to connect with theology and um, social media activism, specifically when looking at Catholic social teachings, which um, speak to practical theology. And so um, I am here today and I want to consider how maybe some of these teachings can translate into action, basically understanding more about how um, these teachings apply to internet activism and what they can potentially teach us about how to conduct ourselves over the internet. Um, so for my presentation, I'd like to analyze the rise of social media activism online by examining the background um, of various social movements. Then I will introduce challenges and questions that online activism has brought up in these movements and the ways that Catholic social teachings might help us understand and reckon with these questions. Um, throughout the presentation, I will try to give explanations of some key terms, uh, some of which are like internet slang, so it might seem a little foreign for uh, some of us, so hopefully it'll help to clarify some things. But for now, I think it's important to start off with a quick explanation of what uh, exactly Catholic social teachings are and what social media activism is. So uh, my studies mainly rested on social media activism, which is a subset of internet activism uh, more generally. Uh, social media activism is activism particularly performed on various social media platforms. So most notably probably being Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. In uh, internet activism in contrast is kind of uh, more general online activism that can occur in any space on the internet. And now um, to give a background on Catholic social teachings for those of us who may not know, these are seven principles centered around promoting justice that have been adopted by the Catholic church and which stem from the Old Testament, the New Testament and the church's historical stance on social 
justice issues. Um, they're considered to have originated in a 1891 encyclical letter from Pope Leo XIII in which he laid out what he felt was the church's responsibility to engage in social justice work, particularly at the time um, dealing with labor issues in large response to uh, worker employer relationships following the industrial revolution. Uh, Catholic social teachings are distinct from rules. They're more like guidelines with suggestions of how to live with respect to doctrine of the church and social responsibility. Um, They're applicable in this study because practicing Catholics are urged to live by these standards and thus um, they can have practical theological effects on actions. So these seven teachings are solidarity, life and dignity of the human person, call to family, community and participation, rights and responsibilities, option for the poor and vulnerable, dignity of work and the rights of workers, and lastly, care for God's creation, which has typically been used in the context of consideration of environmental problems. Um, these teachings actually originated with a concern for the poor in mind um, and have been used to take into account the way social systems have historically um, perpetuated poverty and injustice in their function. Um, and so, so now we're gonna segue away from the theology for a little bit and move on to the study of some various social movements in order to get a sense of how social media activism has uh, recently operated and a little bit of its history. And for that, we're going to specifically look at uh, social media activism through the lens of Occupy Wall Street, the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movements. So Occupy was one of the first activist movements to um, really use the internet to facilitate activism. Uh, the first day of Occupy is said to have occurred on September 17th, 2011, when activists gathered in Zuccotti Park to protest wealth inequality in America, especially due to frustrations that arose from the 2008 financial crisis where many people lost their jobs and houses. Um, Occupy Wall Street sought to challenge the power structure that created financial problems whereby the top 1% of Americans held most of the wealth and power. Um, the famous slogan used by the Occupy Wall Street movement is, we are the 99% alluding to this unequal wealth divide. While there is some debate about where the slogan originated from, it became popularized through a Tumblr blog created by a 28 year old blogger named Chris. Uh, the blog was titled, We're the 99%, and it asked bloggers to submit a photo of themselves with a quick explanation of how they have been affected by wealth inequality. Uh, the messages on this blog ranged from individuals with disabilities unable to find work to students voicing their frustrations about their massive student debt. Um, basically, it offered a space for various people living very different lives, all affected by the same wealth inequality struggles to come together. Likewise, the pictures and handwritten messages made these stories very personal and easily connectable. While presumably unknown at the time, the blog was one of the first acts of purely social media activism, where in this case, one did not have to leave their home to engage in activist work. Essentially sharing your story on the internet was an easier and um, could be a more effective way for some individuals to use their voice in protest even better than uh, maybe physical in-person protests. Um, alongside the Tumblr blog, Occupy was one of the first activist movements to rely on Facebook to spread their message, coordinate meeting times, and to recruit other activists. Uh, Facebook pages were made to organize protests all across the country. Research finds that over 1,700 people were recruited over Facebook for the movement. Um, because Occupy Wall Street performed in a horizontal structure led by group voice and it tried to be leaderless, the system ended up coinciding well with the function of the internet, a platform that collectively allowed many voices to be heard at once. Um, also interestingly and unique to its time, there was another side of the movement which served to make online activism fun. Um, there was online meme sharing which for those of us who don't know what that is, it's uh, funny trending graphics. Um, and in this, 
instance, these graphics showed Sesame Street characters protesting and even being detained by police with the caption, Occupy Sesame Street. Uh, these images would go viral, bringing more attention to the movement through both the adverse and pleasant reactions that would follow. Um, the use of humor in social media um, was really unique to Occupy and isn't really found in the other movements we're going to be looking at. Um, as we can see, someone in this picture actually dressed up as one of the Sesame Street characters to protest, which is kind of funny. Um, now we're going to be switching gears to the Me Too movement. Uh, social media activism here takes a different shape. The Me Too movement was founded in 2006 by the activist Tarana Burke in light of her experiences working with children who needed a safe space to talk about sexual abuse. Um, Burke had been working in the nonprofit sphere to create these safe spaces prior to the explosion of Me Too on the internet in 2017. The hashtag Me Too movement went viral in 2017 when actress Alyssa Milano used the hashtag on Twitter in response to Harvey Weinstein and his sexual, sexual predation of women in Hollywood. Uh, she encouraged other women to come forward with their own stories of sexual abuse to bring awareness to the extent of the problem and the movement kind of trickled down from this one experience of a woman in Hollywood to other women in Hollywood coming forward and eventually girls from all walks of life and virtually every kind of environment. The hashtag has been used today over 19 million times by women across the globe. Um, and using the internet, women made their stories public. Uh, and many found that um, either outing the individual or speaking about the experience offered a reclamation of power um, and provided a sense of justice by not being bound by silence. Uh, likewise, when using the hashtag, women found a community of support by others who had experienced similar situations. Um, the movement largely found itself on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Unlike some social movements calling for sweeping legislation, the reclamation of power for the Me Too movement largely resided in a desire to change culture. And in order to change culture, the Me Too movement strived to spread awareness to the extent of sexual abuse and likewise to challenge stereotypes associated with abuse. Uh, one extremely powerful aspect of the movement on social media involved women posting a picture of what they wore the day of their assault to counter victim blaming over what women were wearing as a stereotype being part of the problem. Um, the movement also, like I said, used storytelling as a way to challenge preconceived notions of abuse. Um, and ultimately, the Me Too movement was successful in using the internet's ability to share stories, amplifying the power of storytelling as activism. Uh, one could also argue the Me Too movement was more effective online than Occupy, um, in large part because of people's general better understanding of how the internet uh, was operating um, and new social media applications like Twitter that allowed things to go viral really quickly. And so uh, now we're going to look at the final social movement, which is Black Lives Matter. Uh, Black Lives Matter came to the internet in a really powerful way with the aid of video sharing and hashtags. Uh, most of us have probably witnessed the video that ignited the movement in the summer of 2020 when an unarmed Black man, George Floyd, was killed on camera by a police officer. Um, quickly after being put on Facebook, the video received millions of views very rapidly. Um, the beginnings of the movement, however, originated on social media, media prior to Floyd after the acquittal of George Zimmerman for the murder of Trayvon Martin. In response to the event, activist Alicia Garza then posted on Facebook about the value of Black lives, and activist Patrice Kohlers responded with the hashtag Black Lives Matter. These women, along with activist Opal Tomote, formed the Black Lives Matter movement, and the hashtag has since been used by the movement to bring justice for Black lives killed by police and to try to stop the unjust killings of Black Americans. The Black Lives Matter movement reclaims power by emphasizing and prioritizing the names of the victims of police brutality rather than the names of leaders within the social movement. Um, in this way, the movement really has taken on life beyond one individual person or one leader. Um, like Occupy, it, had a, it has a decentralized approach to leadership and prioritizes group voice. 
and the movement has advocated both cultural and legislative changes. Um, but also rather than forcing legislation, Black Lives Matter um, has done a lot and wants to see legislation come from cultural change, um, recognizing that if culture doesn't change, then laws really won't be effective, which might derive from the fact that much of the violence they're fighting against comes from the police department. Um, the movement has utilized um, hashtags uh, very effectively. Hashtag use in Black Lives Matter is extremely multi multifaceted and ranging, yet um, uh, in the summer of 2020 seem to be united in a common goal to really educate the public. Um, attached to thousands of these hashtags were links, articles, and Instagram posts all centered around educating individuals about systemic racism and injustice and about the issues uh, surrounding police brutality. Even posts um, asking for donations, they typically had uh, explanations of the function and necessity of uh, those donations to the individuals uh, before they donate. Um, so uh, also advocating accountability was a really large part of the Black Lives Matter movement on social media. Um, along with people demanding justice from police officers who had not historically been charged with killing Black Americans on duty, people used, uh, using social media were told to hold their family and friends accountable for learning about systemic uh, racism and police brutality. Uh, Black Lives Matter, like Me Too, I think also benefited from the country having uh, generally a better understanding of social media and unlike Occupy, Black Lives Matter's goals were more clearly presented on their social media platforms like specific calls to defund the police and campaigning for more Black American history education. So before I get into the Catholic social teaching aspect, I would like to briefly discuss why um, through my research, I believe that uh, social media has been so conducive to social movements. Um, we can see from all three that people have been angered by a lack of accountability in our system's power structure, whether that be the financial system, the police force, or men in Hollywood. Um, social media and the internet more broadly offers a platform for individuals to hold other people accountable in a way that we've really never seen before. Um, and this is in large part because uh, we now have a network to quickly share information like video recordings or picture taking and share it with a wide uh, number of people. Um, and this I would argue has led to a fundamental shift in power, one that can operate and operate collectively on collective action because people now have the ability to form networks and communities, um, global networks uh, to take down powerful people by collectively calling them out posting about them and informing others in ways that they have not been able to before. Um, despite the power of social media, there remain questions, considerations, and concerns of how to do online activism. Uh, historically, Catholic activism has been considered and perceived by many to be conservative given uh, the church's stances. However, much of the social thought considered in Catholicism um, such as these Catholic social teachings give us a progressive take on activism, um, such as the ideas espoused by Catholic activist Dorothy Day. Um, today, there remain groups of Catholics who take from theological teaching to form their work. Um, and now we look to theological considerations and how these might play a role um, because uh, surprisingly many of the questions and concerns over social media activism uh, could be answered um, looking towards Catholic social teachings. Um, but for the sake of time, I won't be able to examine all of the Catholic social teachings and the issues they speak to. Um, for more on that, you can visit the Instagram page, with, which is uh, Catholic social media teachings. Um, so for this presentation, I am just going to focus on a prominent few. Um, the first Catholic social teaching I would like to examine is solidarity. So what is solidarity? Um, Solidarity is primarily concerned with achieving peace through committing oneself to fellow individuals. Um, as St. Paul, John Paul II wrote, solidarity is not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people, both near and far. On the contrary, it is affirming and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good, that is to say, to the good of all and of each individual, because 
we are all really responsible for all. And uh, Martin Luther King might have also put it best when he said, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, meaning connected to each other so that we should be working for the sake of others. Um, and this idea motivated the civil rights movement as King called on those of faith to work towards the freedoms of others, uh, stating that whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Um, but when considering how to engage in solidarity in social media activism, I almost immediately turned to the Me Too movements and uh, the Black Lives Matter movements because um, both seriously seek to form solidarity in the activism that they inspire. Um, and so how do these social movements seek to foster solidarity? Um, this idea of being connected in a network of others working towards a common goal. Um, one way is through hashtags. And um, I mentioned hashtags before, but hashtags are keywords used on social media platforms, primarily Twitter, but also on Instagram, that when used in a post or in a message, connect your message to a larger network of others using a hashtag. So when someone clicks on your hashtag, they're able to see everything that others have also posted um, in relation to the topic. Um, taking from the ideology espoused by St. Paul on the responsibility for all, hashtag use when used correctly demonstrates this care and commitment to the common good. Um, in using hashtags like using hashtag me too or hashtag black lives matter, it implicates you taking a stance that you support the people behind the movements essentially standing by them because this incurs in part um, due to the internet uh, as a movement strengthened by collective action. So in adding numbers to hashtag use, this adds to the movement's strength in numbers and the strength more generally. Um, likewise, when adding to a hashtag, this connects oneself to a larger story, but um, a story nonetheless led by individuals over the internet. Uh, sharing a hashtag increases that hashtag number, hashtag's numbers and gives other people using the hashtag also more visibility. Um, being able to amplify their message as well. So hashtags really do connect you to thousands of other people um, united in a common goal, a shared network of those pursuing justice. To use hashtags then is to really commit yourself to the other people also using them. Um, but solidarity also guides us to use hashtags in a way that is uh, united in a common goal. One of the powers and drawbacks of hashtags is, are that they are really easy to use meaning that anyone with a social media platform can use them. Um, but many people can use them so easily that they don't take the time to really inform themselves on how to use them. Uh, thus, in moving past uh, vague compassion, solidarity calls users to be informed about the network that the hashtag is used within. And a specific problem um, dealing with this occurred during the Black Lives Matter movement in the summer of 2020. Um, for those of us on social media at the time, you may remember the hashtag that went viral. It was hashtag Blackout Tuesday, which was a collective action hashtag to protest police brutality, where people would post a black square on their Instagram to demonstrate their co commitment to the Black Lives Matter movement with visible space on their Instagram platform. Um, and the uh, hashtag received some criticism because some believe the protest of posting a black square wasn't really doing much. Um, other people thought it was necessary to have this visual reminder, especially on pages with lots of followers like celebrities, uh, Instagram pages. However, um, things did get messy when people started using the hashtag Black Lives Matter with the hashtag Black Out Tuesday while posting black squares because um, the Black Lives Matter movement um, was uh, suddenly flooded uh, the hashtag, the Black Lives Matter hashtags network, I'm sorry, was flooded with black squares that took away from um, some of the important messages that were being shared on the network. Um, hashtag use is an important part of social media activism, but in consideration of solidarity and social media activism, it is necessary to be mindful and considerate of the network that hashtags are used on so that this mission of promoting a common goal is not tarnished. Um, and now we're going to consider option for the poor. Uh, what exactly does option for the poor mean? Um, initially, you might think it means turning towards the materially poor, but um, theologian Gustavo Gutierrez offers more for consideration in his work, 
on Latin American liberation theology. In an interview with America Magazine, Gutierrez states, the poor person is someone who is treated as a non-person, someone who is considered insignificant from an economic, political, and cultural point of view. The poor count as statistics, they are nameless, but even though the poor remain insignificant within society, they are never insignificant before God. Thus, the option for the poor seeks to create a society where those on the margins are listened to and defended. Um, the teaching signifies a need to work towards helping those who are not just materially poor, but those who are threatened by the power structure of society and treated as less than others. Creating an option for the poor means giving special attention and consideration to working towards achieving justice for marginalized voices. So in considering options for the poor over social media activism, I consider the role of storytelling. Um, as we learned in the Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, storytelling's power resides in the ability for everyday people to come forward and share their experiences, such was the case on the We Are The 99% blog, um, which gave a platform for the unheard, those lost in the outskirts of the 99%, struggling with financials um, in a system that has overlooked them. Um, we can also look at the Me Too movement, which gave women a platform and a popular network to share their experiences in a way that ha they hadn't been heard before. So um, with these major social movements, making stories from marginalized voices that were once uh, previously unavailable on easily accessible platforms, Option for the Poor calls us now to listen. And what Option for the Poor really wants to work towards is validating other people's humanity and worth by seeing them. Uh, listening to the stories of others, especially when they are able to be told from their own words over the internet, does function to do that. Um, additionally, listening to these stories humanizes social movements and effect that can sometimes be lost over the internet with, um, when conducting social media activism. When we listen or read these stories on a platform over the internet, um, not only do they acknowledge victim, but um, also empower others. And briefly, I'd like to also discuss some practical healthcare considerations surrounding storytelling. Um, researchers, researchers who studied the 90, We Are the 99% blog found that there were lots of discussions surrounding healthcare, um, specifically conversations between individuals who couldn't afford healthcare. They found that these personal narratives provided a wealth of information to physicians um, in that they would be able to better understand patients' needs and concerns, um, while likewise helping patients find healthcare options through a network of support. Um, for example, on the 99% blog, there seemed to be an emphasis on being up to date on health insurance and this um, emphasis on the importance of health insurance through these personal narratives um, likely had the effect of inspiring those who were uninsured to get insurance. Um, and I also just thought about how this research might make us consider how online storytelling can translate into action uh, with option for the poor in a different manner in our own lives. So maybe we don't all have patients because we're not all physicians, but thinking about how our own roles and occupations can benefit from online storytelling is uh, really interesting. For example, teachers might um, be able to better, to use the same strategy where um, reading online stories might help them better understand students who are struggling financially um, and get a better sense for their need. Um, and the last Catholic social teaching I would like to understand in the context of social media activism is uh, this idea of rights and responsibilities. Uh, the Catholic social teaching calls us to understand that we have certain rights as humans that are essentially intrinsic, um, but also responsibilities towards others based on upholding rights that are intrinsic to them and, and which are necessary for maintaining their human dignity. Um, this notion of having a responsibility towards others um, might actually be uh, just central to activism in, in general. And so um, this Catholic social teaching, if uh, taken to heart, really calls on a responsibility to get involved in social movements. Um, and so how does this concept translate into social media activism? Well, rights and responsibilities demand behaving in a certain way towards others. Um, for activist Dorothy Gay, this involved a commitment to nonviolence. Um, so I would like to consider something um, that was talked about with uh, these social movements, but elaborate a little bit further here, which is um, this necessity to create cultural change. 
to protect the rights and dignities of others um, is just as strongly necessitated as legislative change. Um, social media, which in many respects define cultures, uh, culture, thus calls on those of us who are active on it to be part of creating a culture that maintains the humanity, the human dignity of others. And so how does this manifest? Um, and what I would like to focus on is how social media activism strives for cultural change through education. With social media's ability to share information widely and rapidly, there are now new ways um, and newly created campaigns to educate others about social injustices um, and history on a platform that is accessible to almost anyone with an internet connection. Um, this was seen with uh, social media work done by activists in the Black Lives Matter movement specifically, who focused a lot about re-education and realizing that what many of us have been taught in school about, about Black history um, is not the full story. And so re-education is, is particularly emphasized as necessary to change culture because it recognizes that much of the information we um, already have in our minds has uh, likely contributed to injustice and thus this needs to be unlearned um, such as uh, our takes on criminal just the criminal justice system and the police. Um, in fact there are entire Instagram and Twitter accounts specifically doing the work of diving into history to educate followers um, and likewise there are platforms that provide books and article recommendations to continue this re-education process um, and followers are urged to educate themselves uh, and family members about these issues. So by re-educating the public, the movement has sought um, and continues to seek to challenge worldviews um, and challenge stereotypes that have contributed to an unjust system. Engaging in social media activism with a consideration for the rights and responsibilities of others thus connects um, with this education or re-education process online in its ability to create a culture with new consideration for the dignity and rights of others. And um, so we've looked at how to conduct uh, social media activism through the uh, lens of Catholic social teachings. And um, now I'd like to take the opposite approach and quickly examine a challenge with social media activism and how Catholic social teachings might uh, help us solve or add to our discussion of it. And um, through my research and pursuit of this project, I talked with some social media activists to find out some of what their concerns were. Um, there was quite some concern over performative activism, which explained why some internet activists felt that activism could not only take place online, it must have an in-person element. Um, performative activism, for those who don't know, is kind of getting involved with a movement for um, it being a trend, but not actually putting in substantial amounts of real energy to get involved. Um, and looking towards Catholic social teachings, which require determined commitment towards social justice, we can see how this teaching works against the behavior, um, what works against that behavior, um, but also that by following these teachings, there might be a way of countering these habits um, and specifically looking towards the teaching of life and dignity of the human person, as uh, John Paul II stated in the 100th year, uh, person's dignity does not come from the work they do, but from the persons they are. Um, and this teaching, along with several others, uh, pushes engagement in work because it is found meaningful and really because it is felt as a duty based on humanity. Um, and so if applied to social media activism, it would argue against this type of activism um, based on um, ease or performance. Um, and so with this exploration of Catholic social teachings and social media activism, we can see how theological studies have something important to tell us about the internet, an avenue that has not been thoroughly explored yet. Um, the internet is always evolving and bringing about uh, new controversies that it can sometimes be really hard to keep up with. Um, and with activism now having such large social media presences, I feel that these questions are not really going to go away anytime soon. But uh, one thing we do know is that these platforms are providing new ways to hear emerging voices in ways that past social movements have been unable to do. Um, but while the internet, uh, the ethics of the internet are still being debated and hashed out and evolving, 
uh, hopefully studying these issues and topics from the lens of Catholic social teachings provided um, some sort of insight into your own thoughts and theological considerations for social media activism and internet activism. Um, and uh, thank you all for listening. I know that was a lot uh, and might have been a little bit fast, but I really appreciate it. Thank you, Samantha. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. I know you, le you left me with a lot to think about. I'm trying to process everything right now. Um, so I just want, I would like to give everyone a chance to collect their thoughts and please share your questions in the chat box. We want, we would like to hear from you, hear what you think. Um, but one question I have for you. So mm -hmm. you mentioned, and you showed it in the last slide that you created an Instagram account to promote Catholic, Catholic social teaching. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of interactions did you have through that account? Yeah, so um, I had, a. Uh, the, the account that I used was uh, one of the tools I used to contact um, social media activists themselves to uh, talk to them about um, their work and some of the challenges and questions that they had been facing um, with regards to how they do uh, social media activism. Um, I learned uh, a lot about performative, uh, the concerns surrounding performative activism from them. Um, I also learned a lot about uh, uh, the aesthetic aspect of social media, um, uh, which plays a really strong role in um, in uh, social media activism that I don't think is really talked about a lot, but I'm sorry, I know this is kind of a segue, um, but uh, when I was speaking with one uh, activist, she was talking about how um, she felt this uh, dual relationship um, with uh, marketing aspects of social media activism. For example, she brought up the fact that um, pretty posts, like quote unquote, um, aesthetically pleasing posts, uh, posts tend to go viral. And this can be a good thing in the fact that if something maybe looks pleasant or is presented well, like an educational post, um, maybe it'll educate a lot of people because it'll get shared very rapidly. But on the other side of that, um, there's some ethical debate and consideration with um, you know, like marketing and, and having to create um, an aesthetic appeal to um, uh, what you're trying to do on the internet mm -hmm. in terms of activism. And so um, I definitely learned that uh, when speaking with activists. Um, the account itself actually hasn't really, I've, I've gained some followers from, especially the people who I have talked to uh, on the account, but um, not a lot of people outside the account have found it. Um, but definitely interesting. I did try to make it um, aesthetically pleasing, uh, kind of learning from that insight, but um, yeah. So I just want to follow up that with another question. Yeah. So you mentioned you learned a lot about the, I guess the, the practical, the aesthetic uh, functions of social media, how to do it, what works, what doesn't work. If someone's out there watching right now and they're thinking, I, I think I can make a positive change via Twitter, via Instagram, um, TikTok, whatever platform they they like using, what where where might they learn how to do that? What might be some sites uh, they might want to look at? What might be some accounts they might want to look at? Yeah. So actually, um, again, when talking with um, some of these activists, uh, it's something that they heavily emphasized um, was the connection with other accounts. Like so many of them learned. Um, from the experiences of what other people with these similar um, accounts were going through. And so a lot of the, the accounts that I talked to didn't really have super large followings. There were kind of like a couple hundred for the most part, like people following them. Um, and um, they were able to like network with not, uh, other social media accounts. Um, and basically uh, it seemed that a lot of, uh, that forming a network or reaching out to other accounts uh, with maybe similar goals in mind um, is a really helpful experience for learning how to um, start your account or uh, uh, like uh, dealing also with um, maybe online hate uh, that comes up or people who don't like your account. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but in terms of finding accounts, maybe if you don't, you know, want to start uh, an account yourself specifically dedicated to um, social media activism, um, there are plenty of accounts. Uh, uh, I 
don't know if I can think of any off the top of my head, but I can certainly try to, I have them written down, I can try to put them in the chat, but that are um, about um, re-education. So like, mm -hmm. um, I believe there's one that's called The Lost History. Um, and it's uh, just uh, getting to know these accounts and the work they're doing to start maybe your own re-education process before, um, you know, taking to activist work is uh, really, would be, uh, I would say a move that I would uh, go for. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So, oh, we're having quite a few questions trickling in now. So, so one is maybe taking a different view of social media activism. So your presentation largely focused on the positive role or, and developments of social media activism um, and how it helps move people along frustrated in uh, race movements. Do you, what about the dark side uh, of social media, the forces mobilizing online? I mean, many of us are watching or listening to the January 6th uh, committee hearings right now. Um, which is one instance that I can think of, of this dark side of activism or, or mobilization, if you'd like to call it. What might you say about that? Yeah, so um, something that I uh, talked a little bit about on the Instagram and um, was interested in uh, pursuing with this research was um, a little bit about uh, cancel culture, which I think does speak to the dark side of activism and that a lot of people think that it is a um, uh, kind of a toxic trend with um, uh, social media activism. Um, and so uh, when looking towards applying these Catholic social teachings to um, social media activism, something that um, was important was first context, um, the context that it's going to be used in. Not every issue is black and white. For example, cancel culture. I from learning this, don't think it's a black and white, like, yes, you do it, no, you don't, like, yes, you support it, no, you don't. Um, I think there are contexts when it's okay to support something and when it's okay and it's not okay to support something. Um, secondly, what these Catholic social teachings want to emphasize is a uh, care for the common good. So um, if your actions on social media are not following this ethic, um, then for the common good, then, uh, they would be against uh, the values of these theological teachings. Um, and yes, yeah, certainly there are some, so much of that uh, going on, especially with the January 6th uh, mobilization efforts. And so looking to Catholic social teachings, if we consider care for the common goal, uh, that's certainly something we would turn away against. Um, and uh, finally, accountability, just, um, uh, I suppose like, uh, knowing that when you've done something wrong on the internet mm -hmm. or um, have performed in a certain manner, uh, making sure that you're accountable for that, um, putting it out there that you don't think it's okay, because I think we haven't seen a lot of that on social media activism, mm -hmm. um, because uh, a lot of social media activism is so new, there's so much to learn, and I think um, part of that learning comes from um, acknowledging mistakes that were made in the past, whether that's your own or just past uh, uses of it. Oh, that's a great point. That's mm -hmm. a really great point. Uh, oh, here's a wonderful question that just came in. Uh, can you give an example of how a local Catholic community, uh, an organization, a parish, uh, could organize a social media awareness uh, or protest event? Um, actually, there are uh, the U.S. Uh, Conference of Bishops did actually uh, put out some statements regarding this. There is, um, so there weren't a lot of information about um, Catholic individuals on social media, um, uh, how they can perform activism from like the theological Catholic social teaching perspective, but there are resources and information about um, that work that was done within the institution of the church for how specific church organizations um, can uh, engage in online activist work or just um, form online activist networks. Um, one of the things I learned from that was specifically there's an emphasis on community that um, is really echoed in um, in terms of uh, from the institutional standpoint. So that means um, maintaining uh, uh, the values of human dignity um, in a in an online network um, and a sphere of relationship with other people um, was kind of heavily prioritized um, in terms of like app like tools applications social media applications that would be beneficial for that. Um, I think there are a lot. I think it might just depend on the kind of activist work. I think um, starting social media accounts is very easy. Um, and that's something I've definitely learned from this. And so that's definitely one way um, that
that that can that goal can be accomplished. Great. So I'm seeing several questions about specific slides or studies that you cited. Is there a way, uh, instead of going through all those questions, is there a way that uh, the audience members can get in contact, get in touch with you to get that information? Would it be via Instagram account? Uh, or is there another way you prefer to be contacted? Um, you know what, I'll link it all on the Instagram account. Um, uh, yeah, so that might be helpful. Um, for, for doing that. I know uh, not all of the, the research um, and everything was um, presented on these slideshows, so um, I can do that. Um, in terms of uh, the research for storytelling, I have that um, right here on the slide, so I can actually put that in real quick if you want to go to another question. Um, Great. Sorry. Um, oh, okay. So here's another good one. So you, you you discussed several critiques of social media activism, and one of them was formative activism. Is there a way yes. to minimize that? Or did, in your research, did you encounter any studies or did you have conversations with any activists on how you can minimize that, control it in some way? Um, yes, so um, when I was speaking with the activists a lot, uh, there was another concern that came up, um, which regarded uh, when I asked them if they um, would label themselves uh, as uh, internet activists. Um, and one of them said, there's really no need to be inter like labeled an internet activist, just activists, period, is kind of enough. Um, and then uh, uh, went on to say that um, they believe there has to be some sort of offline activist movement, whether you're engaged in social media activism or not, um, it necessitates um, some sort of commitment offline. And so, in that regard, um, uh, mitigating the effects of uh, performative activism, um, that would certainly help with that. Um, I think that, uh, again, holding other people accountable, um, and we've seen that actually in uh, the uh, recent overturning of Roe v. Wade. I know I've been on TikTok um, since that, uh, the ruling, the Supreme Court ruling, and um, there has been a lot of talk about um, uh, whether like, uh, men are posting as much on Instagram about the decision as women and um, kind of those consideration about who's posting. Um, and so when we're holding other people accountable, um, whether that's on social media or whether that's just in our own lives, um, it can mitigate the effects of performative activism. Mm. Okay, great. Uh, oh, this is really interesting. Uh, so you talked about um, how the internet's always changing. We're always using new platforms. So you just mentioned TikTok several years ago, no one was using TikTok. Um, and certain platforms almost seem to be aging out. So uh, Facebook, yeah. for example, people of a certain age don't really seem to be interacting with it. Um, and Facebook isn't even that old in the larger you know, context of media. But th this leads to a certain degree of fragmentation. Um, and, and that contrasts with this concept of solidarity that you mentioned. Um, what, what might be ways to counter this? Um, you mentioned the hashtag is one possible tool. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think one way to counter this is firstly maintaining human connections, which go along with, um, the Catholic social teachings, which emphasize, um, human dignity and rights mm -hmm. and responsibilities we have towards others. So, um, you know, not just if we are performing an activist work, um, engaging with activists as some like um, isolated uh, non-human entity, but um, if we are participating in these social movements, making an effort to kind of uh, really get to know other people, and that could be friends, people you already know, or maybe you don't have friends who you know mm -hmm. are engaged in a social justice issue you're passionate about, um, reaching out to people over the internet could definitely um, help with that. Um, I think also, uh, the reality is that some social media platforms do just die out. And I think in dealing with that reality, um, you know, maintaining uh, uh, maybe if you really are trying to get engaged with social uh, media activist work, having multiple accounts might be helpful for that just, and maybe like friending the same people on the same ones could, mm -hmm. uh, could help with that. Um, that is a good point about solidarity though. And I, I understand where that question is coming from because um, 
I think we have seen a lot of uh, uh, networks uh, kind of fade out or kind of die out a little mm -hmm. bit um, due to like the platform itself just dying out a little bit. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, so another audience question, question, you mentioned the use of humor uh, in relation to Occupy Wall Street. Um, but it seems that, that that element has disappeared in activism. Why, why might that be? Is it that activism on a di in digital platforms, social media activism has become more serious or are the issues just so uh, large and overwhelming that humor no longer seems appropriate? Yeah, so um, honestly, I don't really have a, I feel like good answer for that. Um, a lot of the work in regards to uh, studying social media activism is um, limited and there's not so much like um, information on research into uh, the evolution of it because so much of it is really new and has happened in the past two decades. But if I had to guess just based on like my experiences on the internet and um, my experiences studying these social movements, um, I would say that um, Me Too and Black Lives Matter um, learned from some of what happened with Occupy, both in um, their the way that they presented their goals on uh, their social media platform, um, but also uh, it could have also been that they learned that um, maybe the use of humor wasn't making people take them as seriously as they wanted to be taken. Um, and especially when we're dealing with like Me Too and Black Lives Matter, um, such personal, um, hard hitting like stories and um, questions we need to consider. I think maybe uh, just there was an effort to kind of stray away from the use of mm -hmm. humor that could like, you know, uh, work against that. So that's okay. what I would, that was uh, what I would assume. No, yeah. that, that makes sense. Uh, so we're nearing the end of our time together. So we only have time for a few more questions. One, one concept that, that I heard several times in your presentation was storytelling. And through, through your research, did you, did you see the common, common elements of storytelling in the more impactful social media movements? So Me Too, Black Lives Matter, um, did they tell similar stories? Um, I think that, uh, that's a good question. I think there are so many in, in all of these movements, uh, so many stories. Um, I think that's something that uh, might be, uh, maybe not the answer that like we're looking for, but I think something that uh, was common in all of these social movements about storytelling was the fact that a lot of the voices came from people that uh, people personally knew. So for example, um, people personally knew people who were affected by mm -hmm. um, the 2008 recession, like people personally knew people who were, um, you know, uh, affected by um, the epidemic of like sexual abuse. And so I think um, just the fact that they connected really well and um, were tied strongly to people who people knew in day-to-day -day life um, really helped amplify these movements in a different way um, and amplified storytelling, but also um, the ability for social media to uh, allow people to tell their stories in their own words is something that is really interesting too. I mean, like if we're looking historically, like I, it's been kind of hard to set up platforms outside of the internet where people can just be able to spread their stories mm -hmm. themselves like really easily and effectively. And so I think that certainly has helped a lot of these movements that um, have relied really heavily on like personal um, uh, storytelling. Okay, great. It's a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. So one final question before we say farewell. Uh, you are a member of our second class of Duffy Fellows. Would you mind sharing your experiences with the audience today? Yeah, I had a really great time um, as a Duffy Fellow. I really wasn't, uh, I, I don't really have too much uh, research experience outside of like classes, like writing papers and stuff. And so it was really cool to be a part of this um, and be able to work with and learn from and meet other students who were really interested in pursuing research, especially research that was theological based, which like, I was interested in because that's my major. And so that was really cool. Um, I really like that aspect. And just um, also being able to work on um, kind of a project of my choosing and like being guided by um, 
both David's and um, just like having them to help me, but also like being in control of the project was really cool too. So um, I've had an overall really good experience. Wonderful. That's great to hear. Mm -hmm. Is there any, do you have any parting thoughts for the audience today? What might be one or two things you hope they come away with? I guess just how maybe these Catholic social teachings um, might make us think about uh, like future social media activism, especially because we're going through a really uh, interesting and um, uh, influential time right now with um, so much social just justice issues being brought to the table. And so I just, um, yeah, I think like maybe just considering these questions from a theological perspective can offer some insight into that. Hmm. I, that sounds to be a perfect way to end our conversation today. Uh, thank you, Samantha, for a wonderful uh, presentation, uh, for a wonderful conversation with me and with our entire audience. Thank you for everyone. Thank you everyone for joining us today, giving us a bit of your afternoon and farewell. And I hope you have a wonderful July 4th weekend. Thank you everyone.